I want to thank everyone to coming into my little talk. I'm going to be talking about how to publish your own Kotlin multi-platform library. Uh, my name is Isuru Rajapaksha. I'm an Android developer at Motorola Solutions. Uh, we make uh, radios and all sort of communication devices for public safety. And my team in Melbourne, Australia, we work on mobility solutions. So we make apps for Android and iOS for police officers. And that's enough about me. I'm going to be talking about publishing your Kotlin multi-platform library. Now, there's going to be a lot of code in the slides. And everything is open source. So you can actually take a look at this repo after the talk and take all the code from there. And the theme for my presentation is going to be about a life cycle. And at the end of this presentation, you're going to learn all the steps that involves about in incubating an idea for a library and developing a working prototype for your library and learn all the different steps you'll have to use to publish your library and also get to maintain the library in the long run. This is indeed a cycle. So you, you're going to go through like a multiple iterations. Your library is going to go through version number one, version number two. And by the time it reaches version number three, your library is probably dead and no one's going to migrate to that version. Wink, wink. <laughs> and here are the top 10 things you need to publish your own Kotlin multi-platform library. Let's go. Number one, we'll start with incubation. And in, in my case, the incubation started with some inspiration. We have this RX store library in our Android app that we use exclusively. Um, essentially, it's a, a library that deals with file systems and it has this nice API. Uh, back in the day, it's very really RX heavy. And when we wanted to move into Kotlin multi-platform, I wanted a Kotlin multi-platform version of this and it, it didn't exist. So I decided to write my own. And number two, let's isolate. Now it's really, it's really enticing to sort of isolate by creating your own project from the get go. But I think it's the bad practice and I think it's best if you actually, instead of creating a new project, I think it's best if you incubate your own library in your own project itself. And to start off, you can put your library inside of like a utility package to start off. And I think it's, I believe it's more important because um, you, you can throw this inside of sort of a utility package and once you have this inside of a utility package, your features have direct access to your library. I think this is very important to incubate your library. Although this does present a pro problem because all the other colleagues in your project, they will try to use your library when it's not ready. And to f prevent that, you can uh, use something called the requires opt-in annotation. So what this, the way this works is that you can create your own annotation and you can slap this annotation into all your uh, experimental API interfaces. And if anyone actually you want to use the library, you have to explicitly opt into it, which is great. All right, now that you have an idea, let's actually develop your library. And the first thing you should do is to set up your CI. Now, it doesn't matter what CI it is, have any CI, any CI is better than no CI. And in my case, I just happens to use GitHub Actions it's free, it's open source, and all you contributors can see your pipelines. Uh, setting up is pretty easy. It's just a big YAML file that defines the whole pipeline. And in my case, I had three different jobs. And when you're building for Kotlin multi-platform, you're gonna run into this specific error where it's gonna tell you that, hey, you're building this inside of a Linux host and Linux host doesn't, can't target iOS or Android targets. And uh, to get around this, what you need to do is to specify a build matrix. And I'm using uh, a, a configuration as the build matrix and I'm passing that in as the build strategy for my build stage. And this is how you do that. I can also run the platform specific tests this exact way. And that way you can test each individual targets in isolation. Number four, declare your public API. Now, Think of your public API as an iceberg, or rather the tip of the iceberg, which is your library. Ideally, you want to keep this surface pretty small. You don't want to introduce a lot of points of failure. And drawing this line is pretty tricky. So uh, to enable this, there's a, a hidden Kotlin compiler flag where you can enable explicit API mode. Uh, once you enable this, every time you define a public interface, it actually forces you to specify the public visibility modifiers. And if you also have to specify return types explicitly as well. And if you don't do that, it'll actually cause a build failure. 
Once you do, it'll be happy for you. Number five, don't break compatibility. Now, to explain what compatibility really means, I really need to take a quick detour to versioning. So suppose you have a library version, maybe 1.0.1, .1, and there's some project out there that uses your library. When you do a minor or a patch update according to semantic versioning schema rules, you're actually expected to maintain compatibility with the previous version of your library. However, if you're doing a major version migration, a version version bump, at that point, you can break compatibility if you want. At that point, any other projects has to manually migrate the users. In other words, backward compatible code allows clients of a newer API version used to the same API they once used with the previous version of the library. To enforce these rules, I'm using a binary compatibility validator. It's another tool from JetBrains. You can include this in a plugin in your build source. And once you do, uh, you get this API check task. And when you run this task, it'll fail the build if it detects a new API. If you want to explicitly mark new API, you have to run this API dump task. And when you run this task, it'll actually create this folder over here, capturing all your API. Think of it as a, like a JSON log file for your API. And you should uh, commit this into your source control. In fact, you can actually run this as the first step in your pipeline. So if any outside contributors are introducing breaking changes, you can fail the builds right away if you detect breaking API that is not documented. And Josh and Dustin, actually, sorry, James and Dustin yesterday covered this topic in exclusive de exhaustive detail, uh, and I recommend watching that uh, if you want to know what constitutes as a breaking API change. All right, now it's time to publish your library. Number six, you have to document everything. Um, I'm using kdoc syntax to document my signatures, and I'm also using Docker plugin. Uh, this is another JetBrains plugin that lets you export kdoc definitions into HTML, which is great. Uh, once you include that plugin, you see that build task coming up called Docker HTML. You can run that and it gives you this build folder with all the documentation in there. It looks pretty nice uh, off the shelf. I didn't do any extra customization. You can also customize this if you want to. Um, and uh, the good thing is you can actually run this as part of a build pipeline. So if a PR is merged, it automatically releases this published documentation to your online GitHub pages. And number seven, it's time to release our Kraken. Now, there's a few different options out there. I decided to go with Sonotype. Um, I guess that's really the only option because you can't really publish this to get up a uh, Git, um, what was the other thing? I can't remember. Anyways, um, you can also publish to like a, a manage a Maven instance if you want to, but I just decided to publish to Maven Central. Um, I do want to warn you guys, uh, there's gonna be a lot of code in the next few slides. Uh, you don't need to write that down. It's just configuration. But essentially we have three steps. Number one, you need to set up and link your online profile from Sonotype. And you also need to include sources and documentation. And then you need to sign your artifacts. Now I wouldn't get into detail on how to set up this Sonotype account. It involves you creating a Jira ticket and validating your account and approving who you are. And once you do that, you, have, you will have a URL that you can point to and which you can set up. Um, I'm using the publish plugin and the signing plugin for this. And once you do that, you can include the actual URL. And I'm also using um, snapshot version system. So if you have a snapshot version, you can direct that to the right repository. And you also need to include documentation. Um, I'm including my Docker documentation from the previous step. Oop, that went too fast. Back. I'm including the Docker documentation from my previous step. And I'm also including, um, uh, go back, I mean. I'm including the Docker documentation. I'm saying that for the third time. I'm including my Docker documentation from the previous step. And I'm also defining my POM file on the same JSON build, uh, on the same build script. And finally, we get to sign your artifacts. You need to publish your GPG key and use the secret and the password from the publish key, uh, publish secret key, uh, publish key, and use the secret key to sign your actual artifact itself. 
once you do all that, you are built, you should be able to see a publishing folder available for you now, and you can call all these tasks in your release stage if you want to. So when, uh, when you merge a PR, it automatically releases the bills to Maven, uh, to Maven Central. If you do everything fine, you will actually see um, this will showing up on your Sonotype proto, um, on your Sonotype dashboard, this ancient looking dashboard. Um, that means everything worked well. And now that you've published your library, now it's time to actually maintain your library. And one of the things I use to maintain my library is code coverage with Cover. Now, for the uninitiated, code coverage is the fraction of your code base that is covered by tests. Uh, green means it's covered by your unit test, yellow means it's partially covered, and red means it's not covered. Um, using a tool called Colinux Cover, and uh, this is another tool from JetBrains. Uh, you can include this plugin in your build script, and once you do, you get this um, Cover report task in your verification folder, and it creates this nice report for you to look at. Well, it's just a report, so you can actually make use of this information in your PR, and this is how you do it. Um, using a plugin uh, called a GitHub Action from Michael Kesserer, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it name right, uh, it's available on GitHub. Uh, once you use this plugin, it will automatically publish the code coverage report into the GitHub PR itself. It's like a test, you get like 100%, that means good. And number nine, let the bots do the bump. Now, I'm using version catalog in my app, uh, on my library, and I only have like 10 dependencies, so I don't have uh, way too many dependencies. So I was, many, I was able to get away with dependabot for the most of the time. But um, if you have more dependencies than that, you will have a bad time managing all these dependencies. So I would recommend something like RenovateBot. Essentially, it's a GitHub app that you can actually use in your repository to manage all the dependencies for you. And finally, number 10. Actually, this is not in the source code, so please do take notes. Have fun with Kotlin. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>